welcome to another Space Foundation Space Commerce Entrepreneurial Interview. I'm Shelley Brunswick, the Chief Operating Officer. Today, I have the privilege to talk to Dr. Catherine Forth, CEO of Zibrio, the creator of the Zibrio Stability Scale for Balance. Well, hello, Katie. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm amazing. Thank you so much. And let me share with our audience how amazing you are. Dr. Forth is a neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and world champion athlete. Not only is she an expert in posture stability and the creator of the award-winning balance training programs for older adults, you are an elite ultimate Frisbee player too. So it, this is an exciting interview, I think, for our entire audience. Well, thank you. Yes, I like to use my science for my sports, for uh, you know, saving the world from falling down for a variety of different reasons. Excellent. Well, I recently fell this past week, too, so I understand how important stability is, not only for older adults, but all adults. So I think this is an exciting topic. What I'd like to do is kind of jump into, tell us about your company a little bit. Yeah, well, so Zebrio is spinning out of um, NASA, the, the neuroscience laboratory there, because we're constantly trying to understand the effects of microgravity on the body and how well it can balance itself. And can we predict what's going to happen? And um, with, with an idea of uh, Martian missions, where you're now in microgravity or altered um, gravity for much longer time periods, really want to see, well, can we measure balance? Maybe if there was a lunar base, um, a, a way to measure it before you actually come back down to Earth. And, and in, the, in the inventing and that brainstorming side of things, we actually came up with a really sensitive algorithm that we can then predict whether someone's going to fall down in the next 12 months just from them standing in 60 seconds. And it was that moment where, you know, when you're sitting on this such a discovery, um, we were really we were at lunch one day at NASA and talking about how how powerful this is that now people could actually they could measure themselves in their own homes. They could be 95 measuring themselves. They could be 18 and measuring themselves. And wouldn't that be such a service? And uh, it really was that chat at lunch that my co-founder, Erez Lieberman Aiden and I, we were just saying, well, we really should do this. <laughs> and we got up from that table at lunch and we did it. So so that was the, the birth of Zebrio. Excellent. Now, what I want to highlight again is this is from NASA technology, you said. How did you find this NASA space technology and what was your path to deciding that this this could be a real product and service and a real need that we need here on Earth? Yeah, well, myself and Erez and um, and my mentor, my postdoc mentor at NASA, uh, Dr. William Pulaski, we're the inventors of of the technology. And um, both Erez and myself, we we've had personal experiences where our grandmothers have fallen, broken hips, and it's ultimately led to their demise. And you know, when you see somebody going through that process, and it's so completely unnecessary, it's um you know, you feel powerless, really, really powerless. And this is very common across the globe. You know, in um, in America, falling down is the number one reason for trauma death and trauma injury for any age. And so we had that personal pain, we, we felt it. Um, and so then when you have the power of a solution, of prediction at your fingertips, we couldn't just keep it just for a few astronauts. We had to make it available to everybody here in the world. So that's where we're like, okay, our new mission is to save the world from falling down. I think that's fantastic. And for our audience, for all those entrepreneurs that are out there listening, a great place to look for some of these amazing uh, space technologies is the NASA Technology Transfer Office. There are thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized. So I think this is amazing. Now, Katie, can you share a little bit more about your background and journey? Did you start thinking I'm going to be part of the space industry or how did you, you know, how did you get here? How did I get here? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just with any career, you know, you you go towards your interests. I did really enjoy science and biology and physiology, learned that human phys physiology was my true passion. And, um, and of course, being an athlete, competing many different sports, and then, you know, um, certainly in, in my 20s, really focusing on a particular sport, I, um, I was able to not only do scientific experiments, but also experiment with myself, my own training and seeing seeing how um, 
my fellow teammates, how they were responding to, to different physical stimulations. And uh, so that all brought me together to human performance. Well, what is space flight anyway? Is this just everything people do in their lives? It is human performance. It's not just whether I'm going to the Olympics or not. It is, can I, um, you know, have a good quality of life when I am 95? Is it I can sustain space travel and, and be healthy and maintain myself? This is all human performance. And so to me, um, the continuum is, is broad and huge and I covered it all. And I particularly enjoy space flight because you have to be really creative as um, a solution provider, as a scientist for space flight, because you yourself, the vast majority of people have not experienced it. You have to think not just out of the box, but out of this world. <laughs> and I really, really enjoy that challenge. And so that's what led me towards space flight. And I did my PhD at the University of Houston, coming from England, um, because I wanted to do it in a new science for space flight, and of course, continue on at NASA. So, um, so yeah, that's been my path. I thought I was going to be an academic though for my entire life. That was the intent and the plan, but you know, there are these moments where you have something that's just too good and um, it was clear. There was, there was work to be done. Um, as I did my science, it was to help people. And so when you've got something that you can then actually share to make a real difference in their life, not just from a health perspective, but also from a psychological perspective too, like allow them greater dignity and hope in their in their daily life was just that was too good to, to pass up that's that's fantastic and i love how you share that and you shared that you've had partners along the way because we always say at space foundation no one goes to space alone there are thousands of people behind those astronauts or the rovers that are on mars supporting those activities and you listed a couple of your partners along the way could you share a little bit about the partners who've helped you in this journey and what they did to help make this journey easier and bring this product to market as well. Gosh, well, that's a big question, isn't it? Because <laughs> there's always a village. <laughs> and and now I feel like I'm on the uh, stage at the Emmys trying to like name all of the right people. <laughs> but uh, you know, you've got to start. NASA has been amazingly supportive and I have to really give them a shout out because before there was a lot of awareness, gender awareness in the workplace, um, I have felt that NASA has been um, gender agnostic. Um, you know, people are there to get the the engineering job done, get the science job done, and it, it's quite um, it's very practical in the way that they handle it. So, as a female, um, as a female scientist, it was a wonderful place to be and to be supported. Um, I mentioned Dr. William Pulaski, my mentor at NASA, just brilliant. Even when I had two children. Um, we would meet in playgrounds and talk science and, um, you know, we were, you're creative, you have to make things work. And um, so I, I think having that as my foundation for then launching into the business world um, has a very um, warm, fuzzy feeling to it, I have to say. Um, then you go into the business world, felt a little bit more cutthroat, <laughs> be honest about that one. Certainly as a female, um, female entrepreneurs, do not get the same level of funding as males. Um, it's 2% of venture capitalist funding that go to female founded companies. Um, even in the pandemic, digital health, of which we're a part of, that um, started to boom. Money flowed quite a lot, went up quite dramatically for digital health companies, but for female founded companies, it went down by 30%. And so, you know, what's the village that you need as a female founder to help support you through taking this science all the way through to um, a viable and, and successful company? So, you know, that side of it, the business um, development side of it, we've got some amazing investors that can see, see the value. Um, a lot of them are fathers of, of girls, you know, they, they get it. <laughs> and, uh, and, so they, they've been instrumental in, in the guidance and the, the help of the company moving forwards. And then we were at the Texas Medical Center Innovation Institute for the very first year of their accelerator program. That was a wonderful program to help um, shape us and guide us through the, the medical um, device process. So, um, 
you know, there's another group that's been wonderful. And we've had a couple of other accelerator programs that have also then supported us. We've got um, a group called Always, um, particularly focused on women entrepreneurs, uh, the Springboard Enterprise Group in the Northeast, also really supportive. Um, the Houston ecosystem has been magnificent. Um, so a lot of a lot of shout outs to a lot of different people and I haven't covered at least maybe even half of them at this point, but um, but certainly by being um, open to to the sources that are around you and um, my gosh, even um, even NASA, they created a, a promo video for us. Um, so, you know, that in of itself to have a highly produced piece of video content has been really wonderful to have. And um, so, yeah, you put all of that together and that really helps to boost us up. We feel like we're the rocket ship with all of the uh, the crew behind us getting us set and and letting us take off. And then, you know, we do that last bit. You know, we might be doing the EVAs or, or whatever. But but, yeah, there is a big village, a big team behind us. Fantastic. And at Space Foundation, through our Center for Innovation and Education, we do have a five-step workforce development roadmap, and it's about awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. And you highlighted a lot of the opportunities of connecting and networking in the industry. And I think that's really something that is important for entrepreneurs, that if you want to be in a business, build that network that supports you. And you highlighted, you know, Houston and NASA and partnerships and um, accelerators and incubators. And I share that with our audience, that if you want to be an entrepreneur, build those networks to help you uh, be successful. Do you, do you know what, though, Shelley? Um, at least the first two years, I, um, I was, uh, what was the film with Jim Carrey about? Was it Yes Man or something like that? Where he had to say yes to everything. Yes, and that that's how I was. Like uh, for the first two years, I decided I was going to say yes to pretty much every networking opportunity. Obviously, not yes to decisions on things, but uh, but any any class, any webinar, um, you know, all these little things because. Um, I started to realize that as soon as I was doing something that I thought, oh, I don't know if I have time for that, or um, is that so relevant, I would do it. And then I'd have this moment of, oh my gosh, I had no idea. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, this is a really good strategy. And so for a good two years, I, I did that where, and it was tiring, but I did absolutely everything. And then, and this is me as a scientist, becoming a business person. And so, you know, I, I acquired an awful lot of information and that's what allowed me to then progress and to, to really continue through with the company. I'm a lot more picky now um, because I've learned a lot. Um, and it's actually quite nice if I do find myself taking perhaps a webinar um, and I realize I actually know all the content. So that then boosts the confidence of, yeah, okay. I do have an MBA by experience at this point. I, I really like that. I call that the power of yes. And I did that during COVID. Obviously, you know, when COVID happened, the Space Foundation does a lot of in-person events. We do a lot of in-person education programs, um, entrepreneurial programs, and we do obviously our space symposium in person. So we did a big digital transformation and you got to meet part of our amazing digital engagement team earlier, um, Joel and Slade. But we also, I looked at the power of yes. People were coming out and saying, will you do this event virtually? And I had never done virtual events, but I said yes. And I was that person who had to figure out, how do I use Zoom? I've never used Zoom. Now now there's platforms, all kinds of platforms. But I, I think that's a great lesson for our audience that if you want to be an entrepreneur, that power of yes, you sometimes have to get out there. You have to accept those uh, speaking engagements, even if you don't think you're ready. Join that webinar, learn, network. It is challenging networking uh, virtually. You know, you got to go into those separate virtual rooms and meet people. But I'm going to say over the last year, um, the Space Foundation, our digital engagement and outward uh, trajectory has grown exponentially because people were looking for leadership, that thought leadership the Space Foundation was putting out over the last year. So I sure that's a great lesson learned for, your, for our audience, the power of yes. You did highlight a little bit about entrepreneurial being an entrepreneur and it is a challenging environment and we always talk to when we do our entrepreneurial programs we talk about creating a positioning statement you know what is your why who is your target audience 
What is your product? Who is the competition? What is the way forward? And you identified that being an entrepreneur, you are a business person. There is competition, uh, competition for resources, um, investment, uh, finding your customers. So what has been some of the biggest challenges you've overcome as an entrepreneur? Ooh, biggest challenges. Um, funding. Absolutely. Without a doubt is funding. Everything else we can we can sort out. Um, we let's see. I mean, we had, um, I guess, a few a few challenges to get over. We needed to collect longitudinal data. That takes a long time. Um, we needed we had a female founder, which, you know, you don't want to say that that's a a challenge, but it ends up being so. Um, it also ends up being a, a huge positive too. Um, I think being in, um, Houston is a, a network that is growing, which is fantastic. Um, when we first started, when we first invented this technology, um, you know, a good decade ago, there was, it wasn't the same as where it is now. You didn't have any accelerators. You didn't have, even the, the NASA tech transfer office wasn't um, the same as to what it is today. Um, and so you've got, you know, you've got the two coasts, you've got um, the Bay Area and uh, the Northeast that seem to have an ecosystem where money is just flowing a lot more readily um, and a lot quicker. And so, so you know, we, we struggled to get the money early. Um, and then now, you know, it's coming a lot easier to us because we've we've ticked off a lot of boxes and we've had to be really creative in the way that we've utilized money and the way we've hit milestones. Um, but I, I think the thing that I will say about all of that is that it's, it's going to be hard. Um, it always is. But everything is a double-edged sword. So, you know, where we might have struggled, we then had to innovate. How can we, how can we do our advertising with no budget? <laughs> and you come up with some pretty great ideas. And how can we, um, how can we generate um, interest? How can we really show investors who aren't in our market? Oh, sorry, in our um, local area, how can we get to them without having to travel loads? And solving those problems have actually turned into a huge advantage for us. So I think the main, you know, we talked about the yes, but here's another great thing is that everything is a double-edged sword, everything. So those groups that get money really early, well, they blew a lot of money and that doesn't look very good on them. <laughs> so if you don't have so much early on and you figure out how to really maximize that money, that's a great thing too. Um, now, of course, if someone said, well, if you do it all again and they gave you 5 million right at the beginning, would you do that? Of course they would, <laughs> but I'd like to have the knowledge that I now have for it. So, you know, the struggles, learning, there's always pain with learning. And, uh, and when you have those moments of struggle, if, um, you know, if you can just find a way through it, you will be stronger for it in the end. And, and where we are now, having been through some of those struggles and now having resources, um, we're a lot more careful and picky about those resources. Um, we, we're also very creative in some of our strategies that I think um, will end up paying off in dividends for us. So um, we'll see how you know our story continues and how it ends. But um, but with those struggles, double-edged sword. Try and as, as hard as it is, try and see the advantage of you know the other side of it. I think that's fantastic. The double-edged sword, just just like they say, sometimes your strengths can also be your weaknesses, or weaknesses can be strengths. So, what we'll do is we're going to take a short break for some great insight on what's happening at Space Foundation. Space Foundation is a nonprofit advocate organization offering gateways to information, education, and collaboration for space exploration and space-inspired industries that drive the global space ecosystem. Space Foundation, advocating for innovation, bettering life on Earth. Welcome back to our entrepreneurial interview with Dr. Catherine Forth, CEO of Zibrio, the creator of the stability scale for balance. We just left off with what were some of your biggest challenges. So I'd like to say, what are some of your biggest successes that have been that have happened to you so far? Well, I mean, I suppose I was alluding to it a little bit earlier in that, you know, as you're being creative and you're working on a, a limited budget and things, um, 
you can find that when the successes come, they can suddenly come in a cluster. So for us, uh, they definitely ov were overlaying each other. Um, and that's what led us to, you know, really ramping up. We had some clinical trials. Um, those clinical trials were incredibly successful. And um, it was actually, when, it was an unintended result. It was a four month study that ended up being a two year study because we were waiting for people to fall down. And then those fall events didn't happen. <laughs> and, well, not, not enough of them. So we kept extending and extending. Plus the, uh, the older adults that were using the technology were super excited about it and didn't want to let it go. They kept bringing their friends in. So we get, kept getting new people signing up for our study. And, and in the end, that study, while it was exploratory for us, ended up being one of our best pieces of marketing and learning. Um, I went to a particular senior living facility where we had this implementation and I visited them every Friday for two years <laughs> and I just chatted to them. And so, you know, what felt right at the time, um, I now, you know, learned was actually really good practice, <laughs> like connecting with your customer, trying to work out that uh, product market fit. And, and me just listening to them, it created new products for us, new um, insights. And uh, now ultimately in the end, we've just literally just this last week, we had another paper published, which were the results from that study that demonstrated a 74% reduction in falls, 54% reduction in number of people who fell from them having access to measuring with our equipment. Um, and there was no intervention. It's a little bit like the Fitbit effect. So, so that was when we've had our publications come through, that has been a, a big, um, a big win for us. Certainly as scientists, it feels really good anyway, but we're selling into the clinical market and those manuscripts are huge. Um, you know, that's the, the validation that they need to see. Um, so th those have been some pretty great moments. Also, um, we just recently finished a pilot with um, a health system that is now converting through to a customer. So that's pretty exciting to see it all in action. Um, pandemic, that, I know you wouldn't call that a win exactly, but uh, for us, when um, you have a device that measures something that people didn't realize that you could properly measure, um, the concept of testing, the concept of prevention has actually, it's very easy to slip out of people's minds. Um, think about it with yourselves. Like, you know, you need to exercise. <laughs> do, you, do you exercise as much as you think you should? <laughs> do you eat as healthy as you think you should? Um, you know, we're all, we all are human and, uh, and we, the psychology of prevention, it's, it would go much longer than this actual uh, interview. So I won't delve into it too much, but you know, there's, it's hard. It's, it's a future point. And, and how do you even measure something that you prevented? So, so there is some, has been some challenges on the, um, the health system side of it, but the pandemic has now created this consciousness about testing and prevention and how important that is to really maintain the health of the population. And so, so that's really actually helped us our, our measuring system is now reimbursable as a remote patient monitoring device that has transpired because of the pandemic too. So, so we've definitely um, um, benefited by, by the change in attitude. This attitude wasn't expected for another five years and it's just accelerated it dramatically. So, um, so that's been a, a bit of a, a win. <laughs> I have to put in air quotes because you know, I can't I don't think you can really call a pandemic a win <laughs> for humankind. Um, and then what are some other big things? We've won innovation awards at CES, so the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, we won the, the 2020 Honoree Award there, which is pretty great. AARP, uh, we've won a number of awards with them, including the Grand Pitch Challenge. And um, we now are one of the companies in the innovation labs and obviously ARP is a wonderful partner for us to be connecting through to and and working with. So um, so those are those are some of the the highlights that are going on. And um, you know, quite frankly, we um, we really try and focus on daily highlights too. And um, you know, even just today, we've had a, a software product just internally launch for testing, and and that was a pretty good feeling. Awesome. That's fantastic. There are so many um, great successes and things you highlighted for our entrepreneurs listening. You know, again, the Space Foundation has our 
positioning statement that we always encourage all entrepreneurs to create. You know, what is your why? Who is your target audience? What is your product? Who is the competition? What is the way forward? And you really highlighted one, getting the data that backs up what you're doing. You know, having that data, you know, the Space Foundation, we do entrepreneurial and educational programs. Everybody wants to see the data on how do you make a difference. And the other part is you met with customers, right? You went into the senior living facilities and you met with your customers and you listened to them. And that's another great way for entrepreneurs that your market research, your customers are going to tell you what they want. You, we just yeah. have to listen. So I think you shared a lot of great ideas with um, our audience today, which leads me into the question, what are some of the great lessons learned that you've uh, discovered going through this process of becoming an awesome entrepreneur and having, like you said, daily successes? Yeah, I guess a good lawyer. <laughs> That's a good lesson. Um, you know, they, it's nice to have that backup. You're, um, you're in a, someone described it as a marathon. Um, you know, you could think of it like a marathon or a boxing match or a, um, anything that requires a support team around you too um but as you're there are moments where you feel alone and um and you need to have that backup um the mentors that are particularly helpful patent lawyers you need to have a good solid patent lawyer to to make sure that you feel comfortable um if you create the foundation um and that's a legal foundation that's an ip foundation that is a data foundation um, from which your, your innovation, your solution is coming out of, you can then enter into any room feeling confident that you have something to offer the world. And if you go into an investor's room, into um, your customer's uh, presentation, and you know you have something to help them, that's really important. Um, and then the next step, as we were talking about with the customers, is making sure that those customers are, you're hearing what they're saying, but not just in that, oh, yeah, yeah, I listened to my customer. But it's like, test it out. Put it in front of them. Um, we've, spent, um, we've spent a lot of time on some of our software products where we'll just literally watch somebody use it for an hour. <laughs> And you think, okay, is that a good use of my time? <laughs> but as a CEO, but actually is because you are seeing these micro things that they're doing that will be the, the make or break of your company. And, and when you think about competitors, um, one of the things that's setting us apart from our competitors is our usability. It's our connection, our understanding of the psychology of our users because the technology is awesome. It's amazing, you know, vented for space <laughs> and all of that. But it's what do you do with it? What do, how do they use it to make their lives better? Do they want to make their lives better? You know, those, if you answer those questions, if you can fit into their lives, then you've got yourself a winner. So, so um, definitely don't uh, ignore that side of it. You have to get your foundation first. You get your solution, get your data, get your IP, get your lawyers, get it all set. and But then also make sure that you are serving the customers and making sure that they are supremely happy. Fantastic. And, and I'll share with our audience that we do have the Space Foundation 15 webinars that talks about being an entrepreneur. And we do have a webinar from a lawyer who talks about protecting your IP and filing filing for that patent. You know, she's a patent attorney. We also talk about how do you mine for customers and things. So thank you for highlighting that. You know, we, you do have to think about all these things when you're an entrepreneur and you're bringing a new product and a wonderful product to uh, the marketplace. You also have to think about cybersecurity and protecting your IP and getting an attorney. And you also highlighted the importance of finding mentors. And you highlighted the amazing communities that you're partnering with, like in Houston and so on where there are wonderful mentoring programs available. So find a mentor as well. So I'm gonna roll into this next question because earlier you shared that it was a challenge getting that initial investment in funding, which can be you know, a blessing too because it, it teaches you how to bootstrap and really go in and be scrappy, I'll call it. But what makes this concept financially feasible and what made you decide to continue on when you did not receive that initial investment funding? Yeah, I mean, I, I had such a strong um, connection 
to the value that it provides to make people's life better. So I, I saw it with my grandmother. She was very athletic. Um, she was, she actually lived to be to a hundred. Um, she did when she fell and, and broke her hip. That was the moment that she stopped walking into town every day. And she just went, she just spiraled down as many, many do. Um, and so I think it's, um, knowing the emotional power that we can provide as well as the physical and the health part of it. That was my driver because I, I feel like there's a lot of unnecessary, um, kind of silent suffering in the older community that can happen because of of falling or the fear of falling and and here we had the ability to just like open it up for them and when i did visit um every friday for two years i mean it was it reinforced it even more because um i had my regulars that wanted to just chat um and they you know they were just talking about their lives and um, sometimes they would talk about their score and and how it feels and they'd be crying um, or they'd kiss me <laughs> because give me a big kiss on the, the cheek because it was giving them hope when they saw it change. When they went and did their PT and they saw their score go up, they're like, yes, it worked. There is hope. I can improve myself. I'm not just one way trip down to, you know, death. Um, and so being connected to the emotion of the the user remember there's customer and user and they're not always the same um but being connected to the emotions of the user in such an intimate way how could i not continue it was i'd be letting i felt like i was just letting the world down if i if i stopped and so so that was my core drive throughout and you know even um as we're doing our clinical trials and and we had somebody who who did in fact die of a fall and they had scored in the high risk range but they didn't know it because it was a clinical trial for validation and of course the score isn't revealed at that point because it's a an unvalidated measure um but my gosh is that like daggers to your heart when you think could we have prevented it if he had known um, could that have been prevented? So, you know, that's that's a struggle that all uh, clinical researchers have, of course. But um, but all of these things that um, that desire to to help and prevent is is what really pushes us forward and gets us through the highs and the lows. Um, and when and when people hear and have contact with our scale, it you know it all makes it worthwhile. And um, you know, we, we talk about when someone stands on our scale. It's like it's like they have an epiphany because anyone who's listening, do you have any idea how well you balance today? <laughs> Nobody does. Um, so, certainly not a meaningful measure of balance. And so to get that measure suddenly opens people up to, well, I I need to be doing all these other things. And and so it's not just balance and falling that we're affecting. It's also healthy lifestyles. And that's going to have ripple effects across many parts of their life. So so, yeah, it's become such a passion. We um, and feels like such a responsibility to to older adults that uh, there's no turning back. I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and your story resonates with me because my grandfather, the same thing happened very active life with my grandmother, fell, broke his hip, ended up in a nursing home. And then from there, the health declined. And of course, it's not just his life. It was my grandmother's life who was also now living yeah. at home alone with the person she was wanting to spend her life with now in a nursing home right. with his health declining. So uh, that simple thing of understanding the importance of balance and then, you know, especially as we get older, you know, women, we develop osteoporosis, our bones get weaker. One fall can have a great impact on our life and our mobility and impacting our mobility can impact the quality of our life. So um, yeah. I, I'm so wonderful to hear about your journey and how you got here. I do want to ask a question about the importance of advocacy and awareness. Do you, did you was there already a lot of advocacy and awareness around this situation or space technology or support or is this something that came along as you got into the process that importance of advocacy and awareness um i think it naturally developed um you know 
we created it in an echo chamber um, in a neuroscience laboratory. <laughs> you know, everyone understood balance and postural stability. And so when we measured it, it was like, well, obviously, <laughs> this is this is obviously going to have a huge impact. And so a little bit of uh, naivety there. Um, and it was funny because when we first started to talk to investors, we didn't have that validation of full risk. So we didn't have the predictive capability. We just had this phenomenal measure of balance um, in a context that you can't currently do. If you think about it, how does how do people measure balance? You know, stand on one leg, um, close your eyes. You have to do something really challenging to expose the weakness, but we could measure the weakness just standing with your eyes open. So for us, well, obviously that's connected to falls. <laughs> it was just, it, it didn't even, yeah, it didn't even factor in. And so as we started to talk to investors, they were saying, well, but you know, you have to show that. I'm like, really? <laughs> so obvious. Um, so then, then we started to do more, collect more data to actually create the uh, the data that was necessary for that business side of things. Um, so, so yeah, I would we have that? Um, did we have it at the beginning? Not really, but um, but you know, it was a natural evolution to to learn it. You shared with me that there's two different um, stability scales available. So there's, you know, both the clinical one, but also the home use one. So I think our audience might like to know any last minute entrepreneurial tips. And then for those who are listening in the audience, how do they get one of your products if they're interested? Yeah, well, they, they kind of wrap up together because um, we did what many investors say you shouldn't do. <laughs> we are in multiple markets. And uh, so we're in clinical markets. We're in consumer markets <laughs> across the board, which they don't like. <laughs> that, that, that might be why they were a little slow to adopt on the uh, on the investment side of it. But, you know, now that we're getting into those markets and um, getting market adoption, it's uh, now we become even more attractive because of that that same reason there's that double-edged sword again um so we have a uh the zebra stability pro scale is for clinical use um, or professional settings so that can be in primary care think of screening for full risk um that is a reimbursable test in primary care it can also be used for physical therapy home health senior living facilities um fitness gyms even these are all customers of zebrio and then we have the, the stability home scale, which is a home, obviously, for the home. And uh, that is a consumer product that you can actually pre-order on our website that was just flashed up at zebro.com. You can just go online and just order that one. Um, but that scale is also used as a remote patient monitoring device. So doctors can, in fact, prescribe that for... Um, for at-risk individuals so that you can then get tracking uh, across time. So nice to have the snapshot and screening, but also nice to have the tracking over the time if you really want to generate behavior change and and shift your uh, your full risk categories. And so um, so those are the, um, the two main products. They each have software that goes along with it to support those users. Um, on the consumer side of things, um, there's going to be some new features popping in. So you might want to uh, keep an eye on zebro.com because I think in about uh, two months, there's going to be an exciting announcement. Um, but currently there is the Balance Coach app that will go, that goes along with the scale. So it can um, connect via Bluetooth. You can automatically track your balance and, and get a personalized plan for how to improve. Um, and that's across the six pillars of balance. So there's a lot of things to learn with balance. Um, so I won't delve into it too much there. But on the um, on the clinical and the um, enterprise side of it with the Zebra Stability Pro Scale, um, you would need to contact us um, because we have different bundles that we uh, that we sell that support whoever it is in the context they're in so that they can provide personalized care to their patients or residents. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Forth, for joining us today. This has been an amazing discussion and I hope you'll come back. So you got a big announcement coming out on your website in two months. Plus, we never even got to talk about you being an ultimate Frisbee champion. So we're going to have to have you back. So thank you again for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
Well, if our audience, if you're interested in learning more about our Space Commerce program or watching other entrepreneurial webinars, go to spacefoundation.org and check out our Space Commerce series. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. There's a place for everyone in the new global space ecosystem. Mm -hmm.